You could be on a catamaran, you know, listening to the lecture, and it's all tax deductible. That's the neat thing. Anyway, fighting. So we're going to get the answer to these two questions. How many fights has he been in, and how many trips to the vet did his victim have to take? Okay? It'll be very difficult to get the answers to these two questions. You know, how many fights? Well, he fights all the time. So well, how many discreet, you know, episodic, you know, altercations has he had? I told you, he fights all the time, he's trying to kill the other dogs. And you really have to just keep asking, calm down. And um, eventually, they will say, oh, I don't know, you know, lots. Well, you can give us a guess, like 5, 12, 20. So having numbers really helps them, because they think now the answer could be a number. And they will say, oh, I don't know, I mean, more than 10, but, you know, not 20. So you want to call it 15? Yeah, about 15 fights. So that's cool. Already, I'm thinking prognosis is good, because no idiot would let their dog have 15 fights if he's killing the dog each time. So if we got 15 fights under our belt, I'm thinking these are harmless fights. So the next question is, how many times did the victim have to go to the vet? Oh, he's trying to kill the other dog. It's awful. The noise. It's, uh, Jesus. Let them talk. Don't, don't be smarty pants here. I've learned that. They are very upset, and it, but it's very difficult getting the answers out. So I say, then, how many? You just repeat the question. You probably, no, oh, I haven't done it in this lecture. If someone does this, and we get a story, I just say, what's the question? That's all. And then occasionally we get a question out. So you just very calmly say, how many times did the victim have to go to the vet? Oh, God, I know, there's blood all over the place once. I mean, is that, I said, a ripped ear? Yes, how do you know? Mm, yeah, I've been doing this for a while. And, um, and they do bleed a lot, don't they, those ears? And did you go to the vet? Well, no. And what about the other times? Did you go to the vet? No. Well, if we've had a dog fight and we've not taken the victim to the vet, what's your assumption? The, the damage is because people will... It's not what? He's not trying hard enough. Yeah. If, if he's trying to kill these dogs. He's just not very good at it, is he? Yeah, yeah, so right. Absolutely. Because people always err on the other side. If they think anything's wrong, they will take the dog to the vet. So if they didn't bother to go, there's not much damage there. There may be the odd nick, there may be an ear rip, maybe a little rip here, you know, but no. Nah. And then we think about that fight. Do you have it on video? <laughs> Whoa, Jesus. That dog bit the other dog 29 times, you know, in under three seconds, and there's no damage. Well, that dog must have incredible, incredible bite inhibition. So, lots of fights, no vet trips, brilliant prognosis. The dog is just a jerk. <laughs> Let's train him not to snap and lunge and fight. Then we're back on track again. However, if damage is done, you have a serious problem. Uh, I would say management, common sense. But I'm probably not going to work with this dog because he hasn't got bite inhibition. And I tell them, you don't walk the dog off leash. Muzzle him. He can enjoy his walk with a Mickey muzzle on. You know, and you can get one painted the same color as his face, put a happy face on it, <laughs> you know. But he should not be on public property unmuzzled, even on leash. It's not fair to other dogs. And the way I explain it is, how would you feel if my Malamute came up to your dog and bit him and ripped his ear and punctured his humerus. His humerus. <laughs> yeah, I failed when I was at vet school. I failed my finals. Um, and then they get it. I said, well, I wouldn't like that. I said, well, that's what your dog's going to do to another dog. Say it's a three-month-old Labrador puppy. Now you're setting him on the road to become dog aggressive. Or well, say it's a friendly little uh, Cavalier Charles, King Charles. Yeah, you can't have that. So walk your dog, on leash, Mickey Muzzle. And we can do lots, maybe, to teach you control with your dog around other dogs. We're only talking less than 5% of fighting dogs, easily. 95% of fighting dogs are lots of fights, 
no bites. Yes, we are an 18-month-old male dog. That's your customer right there. So number one, vet them really well. You've got to know they haven't damaged other dogs. Now, they're all going to be muzzled in class, but the muzzles are really for the owners. But if you have a dog that causes damage, the behavior will be different. And it takes one dog to screw up a class. Here's, here's rules of education. It takes one person to screw up a lecture. One bozo. One talkative, mindless person who won't stop. <laughs> I rest my case. Yeah. Um, takes one person to screw up a dog class. You will spend 80% of the time with one bozo, thereby cheating 11 other owners. Remember that. Everyone deserves equal time, including the bozos. Okay? It takes one dog to screw up a dog class. One bully, get him out of there. One barker, get him out of there. Explain, I'm sorry you're in the wrong class. You need the woof shush class. That's taught once a month. Okay, I'm really sorry. Total refund. You don't leave that barker there. You've done everything, right? You've done the stuff Kong. You've tried to teach him speak and shush in class. But now, you know, you're spending a lot of time with this one dog. You've got to move on. You apologize. Offer a full refund. They should come to your whoosh, woof shush class, which could be a private consult or a woof shush class. Okay, the one topic class is a very good thing to do, by the way. Teach them once a month, the pulling on leash class, the jumping up class, and the woof shush class. And you repeat them um, every month. And maybe the fighting dog class, you know, or, or, or lunging on leash. And every four weeks you repeat them. Yes? Why do you choose a Mickey muzzle over a muzzle? I can hand feed it better. With a Mickey muzzle they can take food from the palm of my hand. Mickey muzzle is like a cone. It goes over the dog's face, but cut off. Yeah. That's fine, yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I just like the dog taking it really from the palm of my hand and really gently and just my choice. Yeah, you, you say, you, nice question. Use what works for you. The, the, why use a Mickey muzzle instead of a basket muzzle? And I said, because they're open at the end and I can hand feed them better. Um, I like them better. When we get into equipment, you'll all have different things. Like if I mention halters, we've now got six different halter camps. You know, you use the one you like. It's the principle that's important. It's, very, it's going to be very important tomorrow when I talk about the principle of clicker training. It's not the clicker. It's training. So when someone says, oh, clicker training can do this, no, what they mean is training can do this. The actual tool you use can be what you like. It can be a clicker or it can be your voice. Good boy. It's fine. But what happens when people miss the principle and they concentrate on the equipment, they don't understand it. And that's really scary. You must understand the principles and then you choose the equipment. So the principle is, I'm bringing eight dogs to class. They all fight. If I don't muzzle them, these owners are going to have to do heavy laundry when they get home. <laughs> I mean, they're really going to be upset. So we muzzle the dogs. Not for me. I don't mind. So, all right, let them off leash. I've already proven to myself they're fine. Okay, I wouldn't do that because we've got eight dogs and it would be mayhem. But I don't expect damage. Okay, we'll have them off leash, though, uh, you know, after one or two weeks. So the muzzles are really for the owners. Um, doesn't really matter which muzzle you use as long as you can hand feed the dog. That's really important because the amount of classical conditioning you've got to do in a growl class is extreme. It's like you're going to feed the dog lunch in the growl class. Well, if you just did that, if you just had lunch growl classes and all they did was sit with the dog on leash and hand feed it, think of what you've done. Every single piece of kibble you've given is classical conditioning. And if you're smart, every other piece, or every piece after the first three, is reward training. Now just watch the dog, and he's eyeballing this dog. 
All right, how long can a dog eyeball another dog? Long. long time? How long? I said. How long? How many seconds? <laughs> give, me a, give me a number of seconds. 49. 49 seconds. Do you think your dog could do it for longer? Yes. How long? A minute and a half. Minute and a half. Any advance on a minute and a half? <laughs> how long? Minutes. Three minutes. Any advance on 180 seconds? <laughs> you get the point I'm making? All right, I ball him for three minutes. I don't give a shit. I'm going to be eating your kibble and hand feeding it to this Sheltie over here. Oh, yum, yum, Sheltie, there we go. Yum, yum, Sheltie, my little friend, takes the kibble. Hee, you aren't getting it. <laughs> eyeball, eyeball. <laughs> then he stops eyeballing. Good boy. Liver, liver, liver. And what I know now is next time he eyeballs, it won't be three minutes, maybe two and a half. Maybe two minutes and 59 seconds, but it'll be less than three minutes because we're rewarding the cessation of the bad behavior. Okay? So by just hand-feeding the dog food in the ground class, oodles of classical conditioning, and lots of reward training. And what is reward training? I, I deal a lot with all or none reward training. It is accelerated clicker training, i.e. it's not progressive, there's no shaping with no clicker. All the responses we're looking for are all or none responses. So you don't have to shape them, which is good, because shaping takes a lot of time, and owners are lazy and won't do it. You just sit and look at the dog, and, okay, if you look at a dog, let's list. Write down now a list of all the good things a dog could do. Go on, write them down now. You're just looking at a dog behind cages at a humane society. What are the good things it could do? Write them down, not shout them out so other people don't have to think. Who was that? <laughs> Who was it? Yeah, give her a poke or call her on a mobile or something. <laughs> Hands up when someone gets to six things. Good. What are your six things? Quiet, sit, Sh shush. Hang on, let's do it slowly. Shush. Sit. sit down. down wave. wave. Roll over. Offer a toy. Offer a toy. Um, chew, chew, the toy chew, a chew the toy. It's brilliant. Okay. So let's say I just send you now. I say, watch your dog, and if he does one of these six things, say good boy and give him a piece of kibble. Can anyone here predict what her dog will be doing in ten minutes' time? It will be in a sit stay, looking at her like this. And you haven't said a single word apart from good dog. You just selected six things. And of those six things, depending on the breed, the most probable will either be sit or down. Okay? With other breeds, it may be bark. <laughs> but most breeds, it's going to be sit or down. If you just wait for a sit and down and reward it, within 10 minutes, you'll end up with a dog doing an attentive stay. And that's reward training. There's no luring to get him down. I mean, Jesus, it's a greyhound, for God's sake. You know, it takes them forever to lure a greyhound or a lurcher down. The only way to do it is you say, couch, please, and you pull in a couch, <laughs> and then all of a sudden they can lie down fine, okay? <laughs> so, so all or none reward training, that's the principle. If now you want to use a clicker, fine. But understand the principle. It's all or none reward training, which means it's so easy for the owner. Okay, more about this on Sunday. So back to the growl class. You've got, yes? Do you name the behavior when it occurs? Not, not usually. Do I name the behavior when it occurs? When I know I can pretty reliably produce this behavior from the dog, I put in names. So, with most dogs... I'm going to lure, reward, train right from the outset. Why? It's going to work. Why? I'm going to be finished training before anyone has started with a clicker. Before anyone has started with a leash. If I'm lure, luring, I'm, I'm done. I've taught this dog to sit, to lie down, to stand, to roll over, to beg, all sorts of things. I've taught him off, take it. You know, I'm just finished. It's so fast. You can't beat it. Time and trials to criterion. I'll bet anyone. You use your method. This is the fastest. However, it's not going to work if dog's not interested in food. All right. 
then I don't work with dogs unless someone's hand-fed them for a week. So those are the rules for adolescent dogs, because I know it's going to work with a puppy, because the taking of food is a temperament test. If a dog refuses food, how many of the veterinarians here again? Yeah, great thing. Offer the dog food. If he takes it, off you go. You got him. Offer him more and more. Handle him. Offer him more. He's fine. If he doesn't take it, give the food to the owner. If he doesn't take it, the dog is stressed about the clinic. If the dog takes it from the owner, the dog is stressed about you. Don't touch the dog until he takes food from you. It's a wonderful temperament test. 90% uh, of puppies will take food from the hand of a stranger. Only 70% of adult dogs will. So with puppies, I'm not interested. They're all going to do it. I've got an hour to work with them. They're all going to take food from me. Then I lure a ward train. So with some adult dogs that don't like food, the instructions are hand feed it for one week on a walk. Offer strangers food to give to the dog. So now I can train the dog when you bring it to me and I don't have to waste your money because you're going to have to pay me for my time. And I'm telling you, well, if he doesn't like food, it'll cost you 1,500 bucks. If he does like food, oh, shit, I'll do it for a beer. Because I can do it in a couple of minutes while I'm drinking. All right? Um, that really does illustrate the point right there. Um, you can't do it if the dog's scared. You can't do it if the dog's aggressive. So, and you can't do it if the dog's a Labrador. If the dog is Larry Labrador, by either it mean this bouncy dog that does a moon launch, if you show him kibble. <laughs> Heaven forbid you got freeze-dried liver on you. <laughs> and then you're like that boyfriend in, what, uh, Cheaper by the Dozen. You said, oh, that's so funny. All these kids first pushed him in a pond, then they offered to dry his clothes, and they took his underpants, and they soaked them in meat, ground meat. <laughs> Then they dry them and put them on when he's at the table, and then the American bulldog comes out and just lick, 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 bite rivers, basically eating away at his crutch. It's very funny. <laughs> so you bring out freeze-dried liver, and your Labrador does a moon launch. No, forget it. So with all of those dogs, adult dog won't take food, and I'm on TV. I've got to do it. OK? I will reward train. Fearful dog, aggressive dog and crazy, rambunctious, hyperactive dog reward train. But it's all or none reward train, especially to get him to sit. So he either sits or he doesn't, to lie down. He either lies down or he doesn't, to look at me. He's either looking at me or he's not. It's all all or none training. There's no shaping involved. Uh, when would I shape? That would be a reserve. Real complicated training, like I want to get the dog to re find my car keys and to put them in my hand. I would shape him and would probably use a secondary reinforce, something like a clicker, to do that. It would be too complicated to lure. Okay? We could chain it from the end by teaching off. It's the best way I know to teach take it, because you go off, good boy, then take it, the dog just takes it. Then you hold a dumbbell and say off, and you say take it, and the Akita just grabs it. And you say thank you and take it back. So then we say thank you take it back, thank you, take it back. Then we drop it on the floor and say, thank you. The dog picks it up and gives it to you. Then you toss it further. Then you throw it out of the room. Then you hide it. So you could chain it from the end, OK? Um, or you would shape it from the beginning. Up to you. <laughs> I personally think it's always better teaching behaviors from the end. And the reason is, as a child, um, I used to recite poetry. Um, on stage, and um, you probably won't believe this, but there are two things that make me nervous. And one is jumping out of an aeroplane, which I will never do. <laughs> I promised myself I'd do it before I was 50, and when I was 49 years old, 11 months and a few days, I thought, no, I won't. <laughs> Why do I have to do that? It'll frighten the living daylights out of me. The sad thing is, I knew if I did it once, I'd love it. I'd love skydiving. I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to jump out of a plane. Sorry. Don't worry. If we're crashing, I will rip the parachute from your child's arms <laughs> and put it on and jump. I have no problem jumping out then. Um, and the other thing is reciting learnt lines. How many people have seen me at the APDT do, like when I was the Wizard of Pause? 
I was so nervous. I mean, it just... Well, I was the only one who didn't rehearse, and I had to learn these lines. And it just... I know them. I'm in the bathroom. I was eating in the banquet, and I was doing my lines. I get up on stage and go, ah. <laughs> and that's why we just ad-libbed the whole thing and why they're laughing. I just cannot remember a thing on stage. And so when I was young, I learned the way to learn lines is you learn the last line first, then the second to last, and last, and so on. So as you're reciting, if you can just say the first line, you're always reciting to strength. Most people learn the first line first, and that's all they can remember, and they're always reciting to oh, forgetfulness. Okay? So that's how I like to train dogs too. I think if we just teach them thank you, then retrieve or fetch will be very, very simple. All right? So back to the growl class. Um, we're going to teach two things. One is for owners to control the dogs around other dogs, then eventually we're going to let the dogs off leash and get them to play. The owners are going to be as nervous as cats. Now, in the videos that I have out, we don't actually do it that way. Um, and this is an example of a trainer, me, being forced to compromise my training methods because the producer is hassling me. She wants stuff to happen quickly. So I'm going to show you some scenes. It works. And it works because my timing is exquisite. And I want you to count the number of good dogs versus the number of ah! So number of reprimands versus number of good dogs. Because when you watch it, all you will hear is the reprimands. But we're working on about a five to one ratio here. And that's why the dog's learning from me. And the only way, the reason I took over from the owner was the producer says, it's not happening. Make it happen quickly. We're filming. Okay? Do not reprimand at all when I'm doing this. I reprimand at other times when I'm teaching a dog that feels perfectly fine, but I don't reprimand with a dog that has a temperament glitch that may react adversely if I shout. So if the dog is fearful, or if the dogs are fighting dogs, one shout and they could all go off. Fourth is I didn't realize it was this dog's worst enemy. In real life. Okay, so the dog you want going by is a friendly dog first. <laughs> then another friendly dog, then another one, then a friendly dog of the same sex. What we've got is just fighting dogs to work with. I didn't have a friendly dog to do it with. Okay, so you would do that slightly differently. But all you do is ignore the lunging and reward the dog as the other dog approaches. Your feedback is irrelevant to your dog's behavior. You say, oh, look, here's a cookie dog. Oh, he's coming up. Good boy, yeah. Whoa, liver. Oh, he's getting close. Wow, yeah, he's getting close. Now at this point, he's taken three treats, but he's lost me. He's growling and lunging. I still waggle the treat. I say, oh, yes, he's so good. He's so good. Look at him. He's not paying attention. Now the dog walks by. Ooh, he's eyeballing, eyeballing. Then all of a sudden he looks at me, sniffs the dog. Oh, too late. Oh, cookie dog's disappeared. You missed that one. So I actually rewarded him for breaking the stair by letting him sniff the cookie, but too late. And I say it like Jean Donaldson, too late. The way she says, too bad, you know, because I then feel good. Makes you feel like, so my mother used to talk like that. So irritating. But it gives you pleasure, you know, when, when you say it to the dog. Then we do it again. All right, so we'll roll this first bit. Lights down. And here we have Oliver, the lungy dog. And the All right, Elaine, so Oliver's mm -hmm. a little growly, him. right? Mm -hmm. So what you've got to remember is you've got to have a really good grip on the leash. Mm -hmm. What I like to do is just put it on like this, slip mm. it over, put it round your finger so you know you've got it. Mm. You've got to keep the leash loose. If you tighten on him like this, he's going to take your energy and he's going to get worse. So we must have a loose leash, firm grip. When this other dog approaches up here, if you have a loose leash, then you praise him. Good mm -hmm. boy, Oliver. There's a good boy. Mm -hmm. Good boy. If he lunges or does anything that's socially objectionable, let him know mm -hmm. in no uncertain terms. So this is good. Oh, he's a good boy. There's a good boy. And the woo-woo-woo is bad. Mm -hmm. So whatever you say, keep it clean. But now you can already tell he doesn't like me. Jerk on the leash. From what we've been doing, just the way he's again. looking at There's me. There's a good boy. It's mm -hmm. too much the for him. The only way that you can get rid of this type of behavior is praising him when he doesn't mm -hmm. do it. All right, so here we go. Here's your leash. Very good work. Good now here we have a dog he likes. Good dog. So no he doesn't like. Sorry. He's a good dog. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Good dog. My mistake. Oh, yeah. <laughs>
Yes, I growled and kissed. Okay, there we go. There's a good dog. So what he learned there was, well, presumably it's okay when I have a loose leash. As soon as I do this silly lungy thing, two people here get very upset with me. Mm -hmm. The instant we stop lunging, we forgive him immediately. Mm -hmm. What most people do with fighting dogs is exactly the opposite. If the dog is good, they ignore it. When it lunges, they're usually very quiet, and they're sort of going, making weird noises like this. As soon as it stopped lunging, they grab the dog and say, you bad dog. So you're punishing the dog there for stopping lunging. So get the timing right. That was very, very good. He's okay. Yes, I know. Now, we can't praise him too much when he's not mm -hmm. lunging. He's a very good, good boy. This is not good dog. He's a good dog. Oh, good. Good boy. Okay. Now, what I also like to do if you're out in the park is carry some treats around. That's the time for a treat. Mm -hmm. That's the time for a pat on the head. That's mm -hmm. the time for a very good dog. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, Olive. Oh, it ejected because I hit it twice. It wouldn't work. Um, all right, so you're learning. Let's capitalize on the mistakes, all right? Um, when you're making a video, you're not training a dog. You're making a video. So you don't work with a real behavior case. You do not mimic what a reprimand's going to be when the dog is sitting by the owner's side being perfectly good, stuff like that. You do not use a reprimand until you know the dog thoroughly loves you. Um, I would say in this, you don't even use a reprimand at all. It's unnecessary for this procedure. Pure classical conditioning with reward training would do it. And for most dogs, if, if I'd really thought about it, you have to understand, this is the first time this has ever been televised. I mean, the growl classes at this point, there are only two in existence, Gene Donaldson's and Cheryl Smith's. Um, Everyone is so nervous. The producer is like she's consulted her lawyer over doing this, you know. And everyone is panicked and wants it done quickly. The owner's as nervous as cats. And of course, I mean, the dogs are the best thing we've got. Okay. And my brain's a little clouded and I should have really thought it out better and had some friendly dogs there, which is what we didn't have as stimuli to walk by. Okay. So these are all the mistakes you make. And, and, and it doesn't matter what mistakes you make in training as long as you repair them, and you don't do it again. Again, you wanna, anyone want to bang their head on that wall? No, you do it once, it's okay. We all do things like that. But don't do it every break. It's, it's really stupid, okay? Um, I wouldn't pull him back, become a tree. And I would let him lunge, and as soon as he comes back after the lunge, I would say, I was going to give you this, buddy. Too late. Okay, and then you see the other dog approaching again, and I like it when they can go out of sight. So you can say to your dog, oh, look, cookie dog. Mm, and try and get a treat in him. And you think about it. Your dog's stress when another dog approaches. How close? When does he go off? When does this one go off? Eight, eight feet, 20 feet, whatever. It doesn't matter what the distance is. Do it at 40. Why? Then you can liver him. Look, cookie dog, liver, liver, liver. We well, can do it at 40. I bet you can do it at 39. You got the idea? And you can do it at 38. Then you can do it at 35. Then 30. Now, all of a sudden, we got him at 20, and he's not going off. Now we got him at seven. That's beaten our record. And we're giving him liver. And if he goes off, we ignore him. Wait for him to stop. Sniff the liver again. Toss it to the Sheltie. Okay? Yeah. I, yeah, I am incrementally, when the other dog comes into sight, I am incrementally rewarding the dog. So the closer the dog gets, the more I'm rewarding, the more I'm praising, and the better food I'm giving. So it could go like, you know, kibble cheese liver, and good dog, good dog, boy, it's a good boy, good boy, that's a good dog, like this. Um, irrelevant of how the dog acts. The thing that decides the frequency and the level of praise and rewards is the proximity of the other dog. And as soon as it starts to retreat, I stop. If it retreats and my dog has lunged and is eyeballing it, I wait until he stops the eyeball, I just show him the liver, take it away. And that will then decrease the eyeballing next time. Then we do it again, and we do it again. 
and we do it again, and we do it again. And you, you always want to establish records, okay? So one thing that helps is um, you can have the person who's walking the stimulus dog carry like a yellow bean bag. And they hold it like this, and they're walking their dog, and as soon as that other dog lunges, they drop the bean bag. And you can measure it. You say, well, you've got a 22 feet and 6 inch lunge distance. There's your record. So next time, if their dog, the, the stimulus dog, passes the bean bag, I want to hear some feedback from you. Because your dog just broke a damn record. And it really helps the owner of the dog, you know, acknowledge what their dog has done. Okay? It's, it's great advice. Um, yeah, the, 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 the advice is when he's teaching growl classes, he asks the owners not to do anything else with the dogs. Don't walk them in situations where they can't control the environment. And as I say, it's wonderful advice. I personally wouldn't bother with it just because they've got enough on their plates and um, they may or may not do it. But the point is, if they follow your advice, it's great. If they don't, well, you know what? It's no worse than what they've been doing anyway. So it's not like you're destroying the dog. So I would concentrate on, and I, I probably, as I think about it, I probably wouldn't say that because let, let's work it out. If they're going to the park, and they're in a six-week growl class, and they're still going to the park, and let's say they screw up really badly, and they come back to growl class, and they're really succeeding well, and you tell them so, well, you're going to keep them in growl class. What happens, though, if week three, they're out in the park, and they thought, damn, we're going to practice this stuff, and it works? Well, that's what we were trying to teach them, right? And so they may not come back to growl class. Like, Great, that's a success. And they're going to tell everyone, oh, it's brilliant. It's a six-week class, but, you know, Sparky only had to go for three weeks. He's a new dog now. And now we're walking him in the park, and it's brilliant. So always think of... What we're trying to do here is so the owner can do it in situ. Yes? Let's say you've gotten two weeks into growl class and this one particular dog, Brady hasn't had any explosions in any other dog. And, and, then, and you've told them to keep them away from other dogs so they don't practice this behavior. Then they have an explosion with another dog. Does that then set you back two weeks at all? No, 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 no. No, so, it, it, and, and, and this is, so the point is, what if you have a dog, he's going really well, he's not lunging at other dogs, and then two weeks on, we have a lunge. Are you back at square one? Nope. All that classical conditioning is under your belt. And it could be that this dog's a Malamute. And we just hate Malamutes. And that was too much. I can be friendly with Airedales, and I can be friendly with, you know, whatever, but Malamute, no. And this is, by the way, dogs have breedist thoughts because of their prior experience, obviously. It only usually takes one... Never mind, we won't go into that. Um, so, like, Phoenix hated shepherds. And I really tried to prevent it. And um, she got bitten one night because of my own stupidity and broke the bone, um, her humerus. That's why I point to it. Went through the bone. And... Um, I immediately the next day got her around a big male shepherd. And I asked a guy from class, and I said, but could you, you know, bring your shepherd up this path because Feeney got attacked and you have a real big dog. He said, no problem. And Feeney saw this dog and went, <coughs> bit him in the neck. And he just ignored it. He says, oh, you're a big bitch. I like you. Mm, you're good. <laughs> and they started playing. So we repaired a lot of the damage, but, but not all. Um, back to the repairing the damage. Okay, so making mistakes is okay. You're human. And look on the bright side. You're not heart surgeons. You're not brain surgeons. Because they make mistakes too. Okay? So you will make mistakes, repair them. So one thing I did after this, I really liked the owner because she was so intelligent and she really listened and followed instructions. And I said, I feel bad about using Ollie as a demo dog. I said, you know, if you'd like, I'll take you out to dinner 
uh, as an excuse for me to drive down to where you live and if I could walk Ollie for two hours beforehand. So I walked him for two hours and we just became good buddies. Then we went back and filmed it two years later. Dog playing everywhere. I'll try and find that bit on the video during the break. All right, last question. Is there any preliminary classes or training that you require prior to setting up a dog in the grab class? No. No. All, all we want there is um, to check, because the acknowledgement is they all fight. You see, all the requirements about classes are, the danger is they may fight. But well, we know all these dogs fight. What we need to find out is they don't cause damage. But no private training or anything like that? No. It'll all be done right there. And quite safely, all the dogs are muzzled, all the owners are split up. I'll show you in a minute. Let's go and watch the video and we'll <laughs> fast forward through it. It's fine. Play. Oh, okay. We'll see if fast forward works. Gordon, we get your dog. There we go. Good. I just want to go to action bits. Good. Oh, there's Please. a good dog. Good man. Get him relaxed over here again. Come on. Now, that was pretty nice timing there. You could be a little sharper with him. Again, you know, I had to sort of supplement it with yes. my voice there. Yeah. Little sharper. That's got a nice loose stuff. leash. Uh -huh. and, but your sweet stuff is very nice. So we'll do that again, right. and this time, a lot more praise leading in. That's uh -huh. good he's sitting up because you have a looser leash. Yeah. Yeah, and don't miss right. these moments. Think better off so many right. people forget. There's the dog sitting in a sit stay beside down, her. Then it don't forget it. Yeah. Praise and him. And a tight leash him. here means lunging, basically. Yeah. Uh -huh. Good boy. Good dog. Be quiet. There's a good, good dog. Good boy. Good dog. Good boy. Good dog. Good boy. Good boy. Good dog. Good boy. Good. Now, it doesn't help, of course, because the shepherd owner is a bit of a ditz, okay? Um, so if we had a nice dog walking by here, we'd get some success. But see how really quickly now she's limiting the dog's lunges. Her dog's out of control for what? Second and a half max? And then, whoop, she's got him back again, and she's praising him when he comes back. Uh, as soon as I saw this woman, I thought, oh, she'll solve this problem. I, mean, I just knew instantly uh, and she stuck with it. She actually got rid of her boyfriend, and for two years she worked on this dog and totally rehabilitated him. <laughs> now that was really nice. Uh -huh. Coming out with a good word, leave. Again, I would probably still say sit. Right, yeah, I'll forget that. All right. Good man. Sit, stay. Here we good come boy. again. Good boy. Good dog, Oliver. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Good dog. Good boy. Look, Oliver. Good boy. Good boy. Good man. Good dog. Whoa, a major victory. Yeah. Now, if I were in the park, I'd give the dog probably half a roasted chicken for that. Good boy. Because that's a first good pass from, you know, the arch enemy. Yeah. That's very, very good. So, so, I mean, that is beautiful. The amount of praise she's giving that dog there. So, um... I think, this is my view, you can combine classical conditioning, reward training all at once. You can reward train several things at once. I, I, I don't follow these, a lot of the rules for operant conditioning. You can only focus on one thing at a time. My dog does something good, I'm going to praise him. I will drop to my knees and French kiss this dog if something good <laughs> happens. Okay? Um, and I'm trying to maintain the classical conditioning paradigm, but you're never going to forget reward training. If that dog does something good, be representative and reward him. So the usual thing, when I'm in a dog park, I'll, I'll often do like fighting workshops in a dog park, and um, the owner will come up, will be talking to me about the dog. The last one I remember was a, a lady, she's about 65, with a German Shepherd, and how bad her dog was, and trying to kill other dogs. She just listened to my whole spiel, but zoom, just didn't go in. Didn't, I didn't put German Shepherd at the beginning of every sentence, so she didn't realize it applied to her. And, um, and then uh, I'm watching her dog, and as she's talking to me, her dog looks at another dog, watches it go by like this. A dog is sniffed by another dog and walks by and totally misses it. So I eventually said to her, how many fights? Oh, about six. How many, much damage? Zero. I said, would you like me to walk your dog now? 
She says, yeah, sure, really, please. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. I said, oh, give me the leash then. I said, go over there. I said, sit down, watch, pay attention, but get out of here. <laughs> uh, I just <laughs> took the shepherd off leash, and that was it. And the shepherd stood there and thought, hmm, mum's gone off leash. Looked at the dog, good boy. He's a good boy. Yes, he's like, oh, he's a good boy. It's a dog over there. He comes up and his tail wags. That was it. It was like a non-entity. It was, this dog was putting out 99% really good shepherd behavior. And she didn't say thank you once. She missed the whole thing. And it's like Ollie here, he's sitting by her side. He's doing the most incredible sit stay. I mean, think what he could be doing. He could be running away, still lunging, goosing her, barking, eyeballing. No, he's sit staying, looking up at her and going tongue, 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 tongue. Like, you're the boss. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry I lunged. I don't know what came over me. Hate shepherds. Hate shepherds. So sorry. <laughs> lunged like this. And, you know, it's <laughs> so got to be representative with the feedback. Oh, she's way. using a food the lure. We've behavior. succeeded. And when you see another yes. dog in the park, it's surprisingly how many No problem now. And if you say, would you mind walking back and forth a few times? Good. Because the first Good time feedback. the dog to go by is the worst. Now he's getting looser. See you his head look up. It. He's and then again, to move a little. And again, so you had one bad walk by and three good ones with treats. The dog very quickly starts to get the message. Good boy. If you look around, you'll find there are a lot of people that have growly and fighting dogs. This is where you've got to do something together. In a growl class like this. This is an, another lovely dog, the Rottweiler. A non-problem. The only thing that was wrong with that dog was society. It did not have an aggressive bone in his body. It was one of the first dogs off leash when we do the growl class. Uh, the only thing he did wrong was he says, I think I need to pee now and to go outside. <laughs> it was just a, a big hunk of love. And, and it was just society. That was the only thing. He had been accused of being aggressive. When we got down to it, it's like, well, he hadn't really been in any fights. Uh, well, he sort of had scuffles, but other dogs start them. But he's never hurt another dog. It's like, it's, it, this is money you can just take from these owners. I mean, it's, <laughs> it is wonderful. Country, but you can. Okay, we're going to fast forward through a lot of this. Um, uh, well, I don't want to listen to me talking. So we got some muzzled dogs. Collar, because otherwise the dog can just go. Boo, not looking too happy. Now we have two dogs. To give them a chance to socialize them again because they don't Could have you the turn chance down to socialize the volume now a little, because we're, we're just their temperaments are pretty ugly. A little more. So by muzzling them, it makes them safe. And Good, that's fine. Um, which, whatever group you have in a growl class, it's unique. Take out one dog, you change it. So what we're doing here is a similar thing. We only have two dogs in the room. If I take out one dog, bring in another, we have a different group. And it is weird what works and what doesn't. These are arch enemies. This would be a hard one to work. The funny thing is, we could bring in another dog here, a, a corgi, and then these two start playing. It's the weirdest thing. When you change the behavior, <laughs> Okay, now that's, that's really good. It's, you're picking up on the intention. You know when the dog's going to blow. Okay, you're thinking, oh, God. And what she's got to do is to learn to pick up that sign, eyeballing, and just say what? Watch me. Or what we actually decided on with her was we turned this dog into a kong holic We fed him out of Kong for two weeks. Then Kong on a string just became the toy, and she would hide it. And so she just walks along, and if she sees another dog, she says, oh, Kong. <laughs> and so the dog says, other dog, Kong. So he probably thinks, God, I wish you'd brought my Kong. I wish another dog would come around. <laughs> Whenever another dog comes, she remembers she's got the Kong. <laughs> Positive classical conditioning. Okay? I'm going to zoom through this. No, no, no questions. We're going to do this very, very quickly. So you've got to learn when that's about to happen and stop the eyeballing in a positive way. And it's much easier to stop it in a positive way than a negative way. So as a dog, I could be eyeballing you, eyeballing you, eyeballing you, eyeballing you. 
So you could say, don't look at him. Don't look at the shepherd. Don't look at the corgi. Or you could just say, watch me. Don't. Which means, don't look at any dog, but it says it in a positive way. It's always easier and quicker to teach dogs what to do than to punish them for getting it wrong. All right? No questions till we finish. We're going to have a... We're rustling through this. Good petting there. Now, he's not happy yet, Oliver. Not a happy puppy. But we're getting there. Okay? So what they're learning here, everyone in class will learn to control your dog around other dogs. So in this class, eventually, we'll have eight dogs out here. They will all learn to walk their dogs on loose leash and to sit. That's great. That's incredible. So when they go to the dog park, that, nothing will be as stressful as this. I mean, the close proximity, we're walking the dogs. Oh, he's, come on, he's got the muzzle on for the first time, that's all, you know. Think of his life of freedom if we do this. Yeah. So lots of walking, lots of sitting. Yes, I would think so. Well, I didn't check collars for this. Some may have chokes, I don't know. But now they're off leash. Oh, and you ask the owners to do something. Owners get so uptight here. At this point, it's good to ask the owners, all right, if you could write in your names and addresses and email addresses, and then the dogs are fine. If the owners are watching their dogs, okay, so that's good. Now, you may say, well, is she rewarding him for eyeballing? Well, he's taking the food, so I would say, yeah, to some extent, but she's also classically conditioning him, so he won't want to eyeball. And <laughs> she's got to break that. <laughs> Ooh, isn't it wonderful? She... <laughs> praise, 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 praise. Okay. Now, that was like, oh, it's like drawing teeth, wasn't it? I mean, that was like a bomb counting down 10, 9. Eight, seven, and she only got it at like one. It's like in the movies, you know, you defuse the nuclear bomb at 1.2 seconds. Um, good reward afterwards. But she could have stopped it earlier, quite easily, by just saying, Ollie, watch me. Or she could have got uh, <clears throat> anything, you know, some mild negative. It would have worked. Like, hello. Anything you want to do, the main thing is you reward him when he stops the eyeballing. Oh, look, I have an echo. Hello, hello, hello. Can you hear that echo? <laughs> I've got echo in my ears. That's really weird. <laughs> weird. I think we need a break. <laughs> yeah, let's have a break. People who lent me the pointer pen is here. Their glasses, they're here. I stole someone's puppy work pen. When I signed their book, that's here. Please don't forget these things. I now have my own glasses. And we're going to have a very sort of information-rich, yet relatively boring part of the lecture. There's a lot of things I've got to go through. First of all, dog <whistles> testosterone. Yes. Uh, in all mammals, testosterone increases through puberty. In most mammals, it increases from puppy levels, which are non-existent, I mean from youngster levels, to adult levels, which are much higher. In dogs, it's different. In dogs, testosterone starts to increase three to four months of age. It reaches a, a peak at 10 months of age, which is seven times the levels in adult dogs. It then descends to adult levels by about 18 to 24 months of age. So we have a testosterone peak at 10 months. Testosterone is what makes male dogs smell male. It is targeting these adolescent males to be attacked, rolled, taught lessons, put in their place, what have you. That's the reason for it. All this should be done psychologically. It shouldn't cause harm. It's certainly going to be very stressful but it will happen. And so when you go in the park with testicles on your puppy, that's why it's happening. It's not the other dog's fault. 
The other dogs must do this. And the only thing that would stop them is their owners saying, sit. That the owners tell them, I don't want you to do this now. Otherwise, if dogs are free playing, an older dog must come over to this puppy and just go, Bleh. and that's for the puppy's own benefit. This will not turn him into a wimp. It won't make him less motivated for working dog competition. In fact, it will make him better. What's very dangerous, and especially say in the obedience world, the protection dog world, and what have you, they say, I don't want my dog put down and ruined for competition. No, if your dog is not put down, he'll be ruined for competition. And you'll put years of work into him, and all of a sudden, at three years of age, you'll realize you can't, ha you can't work him. You can't have him off leash anywhere, because his temperament cracks. One of the most important aspects of training a dog is teaching it how to react when you've been put down and how to bounce back. How quickly can that dog, after a dog goes, what about? and the dog goes on his back, how quickly can he resume normal play again? That's what you want in a dog. That's what good socialization is. And that dog will be a good working dog. Without that, eventually you'll grind to a halt. All right, now. Uh, dog biting. Uh, the breed bite statistics are just rubbish. Um, all of the studies that I've read are hopelessly performed surveys. Uh, there's, there's no controls in most of the studies on breed biting. Uh, there's not even a category for mixed breeds. So who's getting the mixed breed vote? Prototypical dogs and most recognized dogs and dogs with reputations. Um, so to start with, prototypical dog will be your Husky, your Labrador, your German Shepherd. It's the heaviest duty prototypical dog. What do I mean by prototypical dog? If you breed a bunch of dogs together and you get a mutt, what do they look like? The end result are German Shepherds. Uh, on the way to German Shepherds, you may get Huskies, sticky up ears, curly tail, furry. You may get Labradors, hangy down ears, black. You may get Terriers, little dogs with a big personality. <laughs> Eventually, all dogs will look like German Shepherd crosses. So they get the mongrel vote. Most recognized dogs, Rotties, Pits, Dobies, Shepherds. Uh, and most recognized by who? The victim and the doctor. Most surveys come from CDC Atlanta, Center for Diseases Control, reported dog bites. Reported by whom? Usually by a doctor or animal control or um, a policeman, police officer. Uh, I did a survey of doctors and doctors recognize an average of 20 breeds period. They can spot Dalmatians, they can spot German Shepherds, and now they know what rotters and pits are, but only 20 breeds of dog. That means if all the dog bites are going to be categorized in just 20 breeds. So the statistics are just rubbish, but they are insidious and dangerous because they now fuel public outcry. And they increase the recognizability of, say, Rottweilers. So now more Rottweilers are biting. Why? Just because more people recognize Rottweilers. Okay. Seriousness of dog bites. Seriousness of dog aggression. Firstly, what species? Did the dog hurt a person, another dog, or another animal? So that's my first classification. And much that I love dogs, I consider dogs biting people more serious than dogs biting other dogs. And the reason for my rationale there is there's a lot of people in the world who are non-dog owners and are not going to take kindly to dogs biting them or their children. And they shouldn't. If you talk about skin puncture, to me there's no difference whether it happens from a dog's teeth or a mugger's knife. If someone punctures my kid's skin, I'm going to be pretty pissed off. 
So I'm with people who don't like being bitten by dogs. And since people have a vote, we should care about them first, because they can ruin it for all of us by just caring about not having their skin punctured. Secondly, seriousness of the bite. We've already talked about um, dog-dog aggression, bite-fight ratio. For biting other animals, I basically consider the same sort of thing, predation. If your dog is killing other animals, that's bad news. Keep them away from other animals. It's, it's not fair. Unless it's acceptable. So that Springer Spaniel was allowed to kill rabbits. Uh, this was after myxomatosis, and the rabbits had to come above ground, and they ate like you couldn't believe. And we were farmers, so um, we would have to go out and shoot a couple of hundred rabbits at a time to stop literally acres of crops from being eaten. So it was lovely that they were now above ground. They couldn't get away from the dogs, and the dogs could easily catch them, and it saved a lot on dog food. So, um, otherwise, dog killing other animals is usually not condoned. Dogs killing parrots, dogs killing canaries, dog killing rats, dog killing cats, dog killing dogs. Right, dogs that bite people, the seriousness is the problem. I normally classify this one through six. And it quickly puts the whole thing in perspective. Level one incident. The dog makes the victim wet their pants. But the dog's teeth do not touch human skin or clothing. You're talking about 95% of incidents right there. Level two. The dog's teeth touch the skin, but there's no skin puncture. Now we're up to 95% of so-called dog bites. Very easily resolvable. You can help a lot of people out here if you just deal with level one and level two aggression. Level three, you have one to four holes from a single bite with no puncture being more than half the length of the canine tooth. Uh, we've now crossed the big line. We have skin puncture. But it's very manageable. It's a single bite. It hurts. It's an owie. Prognosis is still pretty good because it's a single bite and because there's a lot of bite inhibition there. Level four, one to four holes with a single bite, and each bite is deeper than half the length of the canine tooth. Often the bite turns black overnight. Often there are slashes in both directions. Both witnesses and wound pathology proves the dog bit and really put some pressure on and held on for some time. Or the dog bit and shook his head in both directions. You're now talking about some serious tissue damage. Um, I would not take this dog on. I would take it on as a management case teaching them to keep him at home, muzzle him if you take him to the vet, always on leash. This dog can live a very happy life with the family, doesn't bite family members. But this dog should not be in a public park where there's children playing. It, it, it's just too ridiculous for words. Just basic common sense and management. The likelihood you'll ever reduce its bite inhibition next to none. You probably won't do that. So I would really concentrate on management and my recommendations would be in a letter to the owner and their veterinarian to put on file. This is a dangerous dog. It is not the fact that it bites that makes it dangerous. It's the fact that when it bites, it causes severe damage. My recommendation is this dev dog never goes onto public property. If it does, it goes from house to car, muzzled on leash and only when it has to go to the vet. Otherwise, keep it at home. We suggest double doors on the front, double gates. You have to make sure no one can get in the yard or in the house. Um, but as an option, I would allow the, the owner um, can live with the dog if they wise up. And that's where you've got to work it out. Are they compliant? Because if not, I would recommend in writing, we just euthanize this dog now.
They aren't listening, and the thought of this dog being... How would anyone feel in this room if I said, oh, we have the dog and he's here. Do you mind if I let him wander around the room? <laughs> you see what I mean? He may bite you, and it, it won't be a nip. He's going to sink his teeth deep into your arm, shake it, and not let go. I mean, this is common sense, right? I'm not being an ogre, am I? No, it's absolute common sense. And you aren't even talking 1% of dog bite cases here. I mean, you're probably talking 0.1% of dog bite cases. I would say it's time to wise up. Level 5, multiple level 4 bites. You're talking big time. The dog isn't biting. He's mutilating. A lot of you in this room, I'm sure, have been bitten. Very few people have been bitten with a multiple bite attack. It's a totally different kettle of fish. It's really scary. Most dog bites don't hurt. They're so fast. And you're trying to teach a class or something or deal with a client or keep the child safe. And it's like, boom! You don't realize the pain until you get home. And then the throbbing starts, especially if it's a bite on the hand or something or close to bone. Um, a multiple bite attack is scary. Right in the middle of it, you think, will this end? Um, lately, I've been having car crash visions. And one option is not that I went to the left side of the road, but I went to the right side, which is a cliff. And I visualize myself in my little car, strapped into it because I got my seatbelt on, bouncing down the cliff and rolling. And uh, it's just... When will it stop? And you're dying for it to come to rest. That's what a multiple bite attack is like. Uh, level six, the dog consumes flesh or kills the victim. I absolutely recommend euthanasia on levels five and six. <laughs> I just do not see the point of prolonging the dog's life much. I, lo I love dogs. I really do. I love cows and dogs. I like most animals, um, love a couple of people. Um, I love cows and dogs, but I would be the first to take the syringe and euthanize it if it had killed someone or severely mutilated them. No one can begin to heal until the dog is euthanized and then the victim and the owner can start their, their healing process. Yes, Bobby. You know, this is something that's come up lately that's missing from the thing, um, and, and I don't know. The question is, where do I put a multiple level three bike case? And, I mean, say I, this I wrote years ago and haven't revised it. It really needs some revision now. Um, so, a multiple level three bike, I'd probably call it a level four. Yeah. Um, and then we get into other things like you have 2.1s and 2.9s. And 2.9, you didn't have a skin puncture, but damn, you thought you were going to pop. You know, it's very close to a 3, but it's not. And then very important in 3 to let people know it's a 3.0. Why? Because it makes it a legal case. When that dog punctures the skin, it is a bite. And it's good to people, let, no, no, it's a nick. So 3.0 is a nick. You know, a 3.1 is a nick with a dent, and, and so on. Very different from a 3.9, where the puncture is half the length of the canine long. Or approach, very approaching it. Yes, and then yes, yes. No, and it doesn't really. The question is, what about the location of the bite, meaning on the person? Um, the fact of the matter is, most adults are going to be bitten on the hands or from the waist down and the rear. <laughs> so th these are just quantity of bites. Most children are going to be bitten from the waist up in front. And it's just it's where it is. And the point is, I am very impressed, and I, I've been involved in a number of cases 
um, where people have tried to subpoena me as an expert witness, which I no longer do. I just consider it worthless. Um, every case I've been involved, the dogs lose. And right, wrong, it doesn't matter. Common sense, behavior, it doesn't matter. It's a legal case. When it becomes a legal case, it's a legal case. And common sense doesn't make sense. Um, and a couple of cases they tried to subpoena me on were, uh, well, I'll give you one case, my favorite all-time case. Uh, eight Rottweilers attacking a two-year-old child. And they wanted me in for the prosecution. And I said, well, give me the facts. And my facts were, well, firstly, the, and there was one Rottweiler they were after. I said, you have witnesses absolutely stating that these two Rottweilers were not involved at all. Each Rottweiler had a colored collar. And these six Rottweilers that attacked the child, what incredible bite inhibition they have. And what stupid owners. And the situation was a woman owned a kennel which had a very famous Rottweiler in it. Eight Rottweilers and all. A daughter and granddaughter come to visit. Okay? A and grandson. They leave the granddaughter, who's eight, a girl, with the grandson, who's two, and they go shopping. Oh. Yeah. So the eight-year-old girl's in charge of a Rottweiler kennel. So she thought it neat to let them out to play. And she thought it'd be real fun if she takes her brother and puts him in a tire and pushes him down the hill. And the Rottweilers thought it was fun too and went chasing. And the little boy, I think, they said he was bitten over a hundred times. Well, what do we know already? Well, what, yes, what incredible bite inhibition. All he had on him were these little nips. And six Rottweilers had gone down the hill, like, yo, nipping at the tire, nipping at the kid, and what have you. And this two-year-old is fine. And I said, well, I'm sorry, there's nothing. Give me these six Rottweilers right away. I want them to live with. And let's just shoot the mother and her child. I mean, I, I can't. I mean, it's just, it's too silly for words. And the dogs suffer. So I just say no now. No, it's a legal case. Get lawyers. No, they were fine. That they actually took, they got someone else to say, they said, well, Dr. Dunbar says this. Would you say this in court? And a number of people stood up and became expert witnesses. But I can't stand doing that stuff. It's, um, you wait forever. Uh, you're tarting yourself, basically, because it's so difficult not to bias your judgment according to the case um, and the breed. And, um, you know, because we like certain breeds and they're the cases I get suckered into. And um, in the case before that was this gorgeous pit bull. There's a guy who, he's got AIDS and he's getting depressed and he can't leave the house. He's so depressed. The doctor says you've got to get a dog and prescribes him a dog. So by law, he can get a dog. But he goes to this shelter up I-80 and gets a little pit bull. Yeah, but also by law, he can't own a pit bull. Or the landlord doesn't have to rent to someone that owns a pit bull. So now we've got this tricky case, so I'm brought in. Will I look at the dog? So I go and look at it with Kelly. And then Jennifer Messer was in town from Canada. And we put the dog through, what did we do? We did a Pam Reed, we did Sue Sternberg, we did an American temperament test, te we did everything. Because I, I know that, you see, the tests have to be written down before I admissible in court. We did these tests, um, and Jen's doing one test, you know, as Kelly's doing another. I'm doing my test, which is mega pinch and punch and pull and thump and oh, everything. Whack the dog, all sorts of stuff. Um, and uh, then we have lunch, and I said, oh, we forgot to do, this is in San Francisco, we forgot to do the dog attacking someone, you know, dog attacking someone in the hall. So I rang him up, because this was why, it's all after the, you know, the Canary Island dog thing, the two dogs that killed the lady in the hallway. So I said, look, we've got to do the thing where we try and get the dog to bite us in the hall, so I'm going to ring the doorbell, and if you can let us in, but then wait for five minutes exactly, then come out of your apartment and I'm going to attack you. 
I said, but it's pretense, okay, you know. And the other two, Jen and Kelly, will be observing. So they're hiding and watching like this, and then the guy comes out of the apartment, and I come out of the shadows, and I grab him and say, yeah, give us your damn wallet, you son of a bitch like this. And he's like actually quite wide-eyed, and he drops the leash, like, ah, goes up against the wall, and the little pit bull picks up the leash and goes down, come on, let's go. We go to the park like this, you know. That was hilarious. And so I was able to actually write something I have never written in my life, and it was the words of all the dogs I have ever seen or trained and tested. This is the number one dog. A dog where I would be willing to bet a lot of money that he would never bite. And nope, lost the case. It's a legal case. But what happened was the dog needs to go pee. So he needs to leave the apartment in the mornings. So he started dog walking. And he strikes up a conversation with someone in a dog park, a doctor who lives in a beautiful house. He says, oh, I have a spare apartment. Would you like to live in it for free? So it has a beautiful, happy ending. But um, the legal case is, no. So there's some refining we need to do. But it's very useful in terms of now trainers. Number one, you can take this case history, and then you go, oh, it's just a level two. Or actually, what you say to the owner is, hmm, well, it's pretty, yeah, not a great prognosis here. We're really going to have to work on this. But I can solve that for you. It's going to take 20 sessions. But <laughs> I'm joking, I understand. I joke. What you know is it's going to be easy. Prognosis, good. If they listen to you, you will get the dog over this pretty quickly with just some simple classical conditioning and a couple of counter-conditioning commands. Teach the dog to sit. Do end a problem. All right? Lots of classical conditioning when he sees whatever it is, children on skateboard, uh, lots of eating dinner, on leash, in the park, kibble here and there, there's a bird kibble, there's a squirrel kibble, there's a motorcycle, liver, liver, liver. There's a child, barbecued sheep. You, you got the idea? <laughs> With the gradation of rewards according to what the stimulus is that's, that's coming along. Okay, I, mean, I, I have to go through this very quickly. Um, why dogs fight um, is what dogs do. <laughs> why do people argue? Why do dog trainers argue? It's what they do. You know, the point is we can do it quite well without knifing each other. And dog trainers really do argue. So I, I prefer to call it have a discussion. And, and, and constructively criticize, because we can, we can always learn. It's what dogs do. So why do they bite? It's neither here nor there. And all these classifications of aggression get away from resolving the problem. Beware of etiology. Beware of diagnosis. Uh, a veterinary behaviorist or a PhD behaviorist is more likely to diagnose. And the diagnosis will be long words. Aggression may be diagnosed now as 22 different types. You know, you've got, oh, inter-male aggression, dominance aggression, territorial aggression, maternal aggression, boundary aggression, um, protective aggression, defensive aggression, offensive aggression. It goes on and on and on. And then my favorite was when I got a call from Davis saying, Ian, we got a real case of idiopathic aggression. <laughs> The mind boggles. Um, that teeth in my son. Sorry, kind of protective myself at that point. And it shouldn't happen. And what I'm worried about is the level of the damage. Okay? So the reason why I'm not really interested, it's irrelevant, my treatment will be the same anyway. Um, and the danger is many, many people, all they're going to do is diagnose it. They're not going to resolve the problem. So when you read articles on aggression, take a highlighter and highlight every useful piece of information that you read that will help you resolve this problem. I've got news for you. You'll never use it. You can read many academic articles on aggression, biting in dogs. You read the whole thing. Dogs bite for a variety of reasons. 
Some breeds bite more than others. One study showed in 1993, and this and that, do, 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 do. conclusions, further research is needed. Do, 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 do. <laughs> there was never any how-to information there at all. If there is how-to, it may say something like, um, give such and such a drug at certain milligrams per kilogram. This has been proved in a certain study where they did it on three dogs. You know, no. Time and trials criterion. You got a problem, you quantify it to see how serious it is. Then you make the decision, can I solve this, yes or no? If you can't, it's no biggie. You know, there's problems I can't solve either. Dog kills someone, I can't solve that. Can't make the person come back to life. And I can't give the dog bite inhibition where I could write a guarantee for it that it will never kill someone again. It's a fact. And it's, I don't think it's anything lacking in me. It's just me saying that, hey, levels one and two, I'm going to solve them today. Level three, I will take on, but it's much more serious. Levels four, I'm not going to take it on. I will recommend management with a letter to the vet. Levels five and six, I'm going to recommend euthanasia with the only alternative being total sanctuary. That means the dog is kept the same way as you would keep a lion or tiger behind double bars and double locks. What kind of life is that? It's called solitary confinement. Uh, so I think euthanasia is probably better for the dog than a life of total loneliness. I'm not a believer in sanctuaries. I think that sanctuaries are the biggest waste of money and an educational opportunity that we have to spend millions of dollars to fund real estate and salaries to house a hundred dogs. I, I don't get it. Think what you could do with a million dollars. How many books could we give away to prospective puppy owners? How many leaflets could we distribute? Millions and millions of them saying, think you're getting a puppy? Here's news for you. Here's what it's going to do in the first week. It's going to pee in your house. Do you know how to house train it? It's going to chew your furniture. Do you know how to chew to toy train him? And then at four months, he's going to spook at a stranger at the front door. Eight months if he's a shepherd. We know all this stuff. So let's tell the owners up front, and then we'll let them know how easy it is to prevent it. So education, education. Having said that, no, if people want to run sanctuaries, that's fine. But it's why I don't do it. I've only got a certain amount of time on this planet, and I want to use it as best I can. So rather than talk to one person, I'd rather talk to 200, like today. And rather than talk to 200 owners, I'd rather talk to 200 doggy professionals that probably each have a client base of 2,000. That's kind of cool. Rather than dealing with one adult dog that has a problem, I do this occasionally. We call them Ollie and Claude <laughs> and Ashby. We do it occasionally but it's a lifetime's work. I live with them. Rather than doing it as clients, I want to prevent it from happening. It is so easy. It is so easy to prevent this stuff. It is so easy to train a puppy to be bomb-proof. It's so easy to train a puppy to enjoy being smacked on the head. Do you know what we use as a, as a reward for Ollie? Beating him. I, actually, I should have it on tape. It's really funny. Whenever finish, Kelly finishes, I don't drink water, barely. Is Kelly here? Everyone tell, boy, Ian drinks a lot of water when he lectures. Tell her that. Go on, if you see her. She's out shopping. Water, yeah, don't tell me. Yeah. Need to drink water. Take the anxiety pills. So anyway, um, nope. Oh, yeah. Um, we empty a water bottle, we say, Ollie, do you want to get beaten? He comes and sits like this so straight. He's like, yeah. And we beat him with this plastic bottle, bang, 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 like this. And he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then we say, do you want it? And we throw it in the air, and he jumps higher than in bubbles, and <laughs> bottle's destroyed. And it saves mashing it down for recycling. <laughs> it's, it's so cool. Otherwise, you're always putting full bottles in the recycling thing, and it fills up quickly. As a flattened, all right? So, all right, what's your damn question? <laughs> I wasn't talking to you. 
Now we've got two questions. Let's spit it out quickly. It's 4.30. Come on. In the case of an injury animal or an animal breaking up, or first breaking up a serious dog fight, what should the decision be for the dog owner to make the Irrelevant. Okay, All irrelevant. Yeah, very good point. Uh, breaking up a dog fight, doesn't matter. Question is level of injury. Um, one of the things I've learned about dogs is if you've done the preparation, as we do in puppy class, what do we do every 15 seconds? Grab your dog. Let's practice when they're puppies and playing rather than wait until they're three years old and in a serious dog fight with a dog you don't know. And then you're going to put your hands in. Oh, let's do a test now. <laughs> oh, failed. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, and the second point was? Injured dog, same thing. Um, I was uh, actually Rocky Mountain Search and Rescue. We went out to dinner and I'm with a vet. He's their vet. He gets an emergency call. Ian, would you help me? I said, why? He says, got a Bernese um, with a dislocated elbow. I said, dislocated elbow? I've never done one of those. He said, neither have I. I said, what do you want me to help for? He said, I want you to hold the book. <laughs> so we go into the dog and he comes in. He's on the team. He's, he's part of the Rocky Mountain Search and Rescue. And his elbow's all bent. So I'm looking up the book, dislocated elbow. It says, it says here it's very rare. <laughs> That's about all it says. <laughs> so he says, well, I guess we'll have to wing it. And they said, will you hold the dog's collar? I said, OK. And I said, is the dog all right? Said, oh, do anything to this dog. And you ever put a dislocated joint in? I have, since the accident, my thumb dislocates in the morning. So this morning, I woke up. And um, Kelly says, get out of bed, please. So she can fall asleep again, so she can relax. So I get out of bed like this. I go to the coffee maker and go, ow! I come out of depth of sleep to total wake up. And it's dislocated. I've got to put it back. It's very painful. And um, this dog was screaming and gritting his teeth. And I've got him by the collar like this. And my face is here. And he was screaming like this. And then, ah! Oh. And he turns around and licks the vet. The question is, what have you trained the dog? Let me ask you a question. Headlines in the newspaper, the Daily Globe. English veterinarian bites dentist. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. US dog trainer kills hairdresser. <laughs> you see what I mean? I mean, we don't harm our hairdresser and our doctor and the dentist. I want to. Jeez, I tell you, if I were a woman, some OBGYNs would be flattened. <laughs> I mean, we all know that men can't tolerate pain very well. I would lie back in the stirrups with a baseball bat like this. <laughs> and I would say, warm them, warm them, gently, and what have you. Yeah, you could not do that at all. Um, and dogs can be taught the same. It's going to hurt. But you don't mutilate. Scream. Try and pull your hand away. Whatever. It, it's no different. And, and people have gone through extreme pain. I mean, I've passed out in the hospital um, with my shoulder, which was dislocated, and I did nothing, and we had adhesions. And they said, well, we, we have to manipulate it. That is a code word for torture. <laughs> and that noise sort of went... <laughs> and I passed out. And then afterward, they leave me there. And I wake up. And I stand up and go, oh, and fall back and crack my head on the table, you know. And then they dug in my wallet and found phone number and called, and someone picked me. I was so drugged because they missed. The, they put in some uh, local anesthetic, and it went in my vein instead of in my shoulder. So now it's circulating around, you know, and that's not good, you know. Anyway, no, we're gonna, we have to continue now. I just got to check this list. And there we go. Uh, above, done that. Positive year. Done that. Done that. Uh, da, 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 da. Yep. We've done that. Yep. Yep. This is incredible. Okay. Now, here's a biggie. Um, if we look at the two variables of socialization and bite inhibition, it gives you four types of dog. I mean, obviously, there's 100 types of dog, but you've got socialized, yes or no? Bite inhibition, yes or no? So you could have a dog um, 
that is really well socialized. He's got really good bite division. That's a very good dog. He doesn't want to bite people, and if he did, he wouldn't hurt them. Okay? He's, he's pretty cool. Um, a dog I quite like is he's not very well socialized, but he has great bite inhibition. That's Claude. He's, he's probably going to bite you, but it doesn't hurt. And if he lives with you for long enough, you can get him to trust you so he doesn't bite anymore. Okay, and, and he, I haven't seen a sign in him to other people for, for about a year. He's very trustworthy now. Takes a lot of people come in our house, a lot of weirdness. Okay, so I, I call that dog pretty good. Now, most people wouldn't. A tremendous overemphasis based on reactivity. The dog reacted. So, show me a dog trainer that doesn't react. They, they all do. They all argue. They all get snitty. The point is, how do they react? How serious is their reaction? Is it physical? Because that's not on. You know, I'll talk to anyone about dog training. I'm very open-minded, okay? But I'm not having someone put their hand on me and punch me out just because they disagree with how to train a dog. I mean, come on, let's get down to the nitty-gritty here. The whole realm of things, there's a, the whole hill of beans. This isn't really very important. You know, maybe how to train people is more important, or how to raise kids, you know, would certainly be worth arguing about, but not worth dying for. You know, it, it really does get too silly for words for me there. And I look at dogs the same way. We now have a dog that's bad. Um, he's not well socialized, and he doesn't have good bite inhibition. This dog will bite you if you get close to him. But you know what? You won't get close to him. You can diagnose him in a telescope. Hey, look, there he is. See him? Yep, he's a German Shepherd cross. <laughs> Behind a chain link fence. So they actually don't bite many people because the warning's there. The real dangerous dog is one that's really well socialized, but he doesn't have good bite inhibition. He's around people. And he doesn't want to bite them. But one day something horrible happens. Someone runs to answer the phone wearing high heels and it goes through the dog's thigh. Okay? That dog just nipped the owner. If it hadn't got good bite inhibition, it would mutilate the owner. Every dog has his limit to be pushed to react. Every dog and every person. And these tests which are testing whether or not a dog reacts, uh, it's, they're testing the wrong stuff. What we need to test is when they react, is it dangerous? So, by all means, use your assessor hand. It's a very useful tool. And prod the dog with it. But if you've prodded the dog 15 times, you really are niggling him. And when he reacts, I'm not surprised. And my test with the, temperament, with, with the assessor hand would be to prod the dog until he reacts. I would say we've got a pretty keen dog here, 152 prods. And then he snarled and snapped at the assessor hand. What a brilliant dog. On the other hand, the dog that grabs that assessor hand and crushes it in one bite, I would say, failed. <laughs> you, do you see the point? Does that make sense? It's so important, and I think so many people are missing it. And what's happening is we're getting false positives and false negatives. Dogs that I think are good dogs are being killed. Claude would have gone. No question about it. You know, Ashby would have gone. Well, that's two dogs that I've owned right there. And these were fantastic dogs, just because they react. Reacted. Both of them bit me the first time I met them. Ashby was great. He was uh, living in a, uh, in a concrete breezeway with his dead master's shoe. It was all that was left with him behind a chain link fence. And I toss him a treat, he takes it. I hand feed him a treat, he takes it and bites me. <laughs> At which point the person involved with him just, oh God, no, knew he was dead because he's bitten me. That's like his last chance. And I kind of liked him. <laughs> and I said, well, it didn't hurt much. And uh, actually ended up living with him. The only other person I've heard say this out front is the crocodile hunter who says they bite me, they keep them. And you think about it, it makes sense. A crocodile bites you. And, and you live? That's an incredible animal to have around. What publicity? You see what I mean? It's, you know, we mentioned that yesterday. 
It's, it's really cool because it's a crocodile. Yeah, but he doesn't hurt. He's got partial bite inhibition with people for whatever reason. I raised him from an egg. <laughs> so, all right, that's it. Let's have questions and then we'll round up the day. If I miss anything, I'll do it tomorrow because tomorrow will be an easy day. Yes. George has the microphone. Ian has the beer. Life is wonderful. Just a question about the assessor hand. Don't the dogs know the difference between a fake hand and a real hand? Oh, and, yeah. And so how can you use that as a real assessment? The, the, um, does the dog know the difference between a real hand and an assessor hand? Absolutely. However, it's much better to have the assessor hand bitten. And I would say there probably is some correlation between you're prodding a dog and you irritate him and then he rips up the assessor hand. I would probably say, you know, let's put it this way, I am not willing to test that dog with my hand. So I, I think there's a correlation there. Okay, and knowing that we're going to make mistakes, false negatives and false positives, some animals will be euthanized that don't deserve to be. On the other hand, some animals are going to be adopted out, which I think are downright dangerous. We've just had two in puppy class now from rescue groups. I don't know what they've done to these puppies, but at four months, they are really dangerous and causing a lot of damage. It's, it's not good. And so I would always um, just consider damage done as the single criterion and damage done to an assessor hand would be way up there and it would stop me putting my own fingers in there. Next question. Prognosis on intrapack aggression between two females. Um, it depends. The same questions. Specter of aggression. How many fights? How many fights? Oh, I'm not, I don't have a specific case in mind. I just. Oh, mean. you have to know specifically. Otherwise, the prognosis is wonderful. Five, five fights. Oh, five. Um, otherwise, the prognosis is wonderful or hopeless. So, five fights, how many trips to the vet? Three. Two. Three. Two. Three. And the damage done was? Lot. Prognosis poor. Yeah. That one of these dogs does not have bite inhibition. And um, if you put them together, there'll be another incident with damage. And then another, most likely. Having said that, I have worked with some owners who've decided to go with it and to go with the management and then classical conditioning. So now the dogs don't want to fight. And dogs have actually resolved it and lived out. However, it's kind of precarious because if you know if there's one altercation, this dog doesn't have bite inhibition. So, bad prognosis. Next question. <laughs> speak. You have the mic. Yeah, just speak. Okay. Um, for like a multiple level three or a level four bite, owners are idiots. You know they're not going to take care of what they need to take care of and, and manage this dog. I mean, are you going to recommend euthanasia? Because where is this dog going to go? You can't just let them take it to the Humane Society or whatever. Yeah, this is when you have a, a, a dog level three, level four bite. So let's say level three bite, because I'm going to work with it. Level four, I'm not. I'm definitely going to write the letter. We've got to work out, do we have owner compliance? And, and you, you need to do this really quickly with your owners. And I, I have lots of tricks, which you can ask me tomorrow. How do we test it out? But I, I use a lot of money. Um, I use a yes roll. So I will say to an owner, very different from a, a seminar here, if you see someone come up to me, when I have a beer in my hand, and I consider when I have a beer in my hand, not at a lecture, because I'm lecture mode, but if I have a, I never have a beer in my hand at a lecture, but when I'm at a bar, <laughs> I don't expect dog questions after five. If I have a beer in my hand and someone ruins the whole thing with a dog question, depending on the person and the question, I'm going to put you on a yes roll, and I'm going to say, if I took the time out from drinking, to give you an answer, would you listen? And you have to say, yes, and then I continue. And I said, if you listen to what I had to say, would you actually do it? And you have to say, yes. I said, okay, then if I explained it now, would you listen, and then would you do it when you get home? And you have got to beg me, otherwise I'm not gonna tell you. I've so many times, 
I've talked to an owner, the solution is simple. It's, it's, it's not Mickey Mouse, it's not uh, rocket science. This is dog training Mickey Mouse 101. Hand feed the dog, end of problem. You know, or whatever, but they won't listen. I'm not going to waste the time anymore. And, and, and that was actually, as my son sort of taught me around this one. It's like, why do you spend time to talking to people who don't listen? I won't anymore. Here, it's a lecture, we do it, it's a job. Okay? But on free time, no. So as a private case, you have to beg me. So you can make the decision, all right, if they're willing to pay, would you deliver the information? And you think, well, you've got to make house payments, so maybe, yes, you would do that. Or you go one step further and decide, I'm only, and this is a great marketing technique, I will only work with owners which are committed. And you could put in parenthesis on your business card, this means I turn down about 90% of owners who want my help. Let's just get it up front. Then the next thing is the checkbook. Always give a prognosis in terms of dollars. It's exactly like having your car fixed. You need an estimate. And they'll get to the point where they say it's a write-off. Uh, you have that term, you've totaled it. Yeah, you know what I mean, right? That the, the amount of money to repair it is more than the car's worth. Owners have write-offs too. If you have, do you have any vets here work with large animal people, with cow? Oh, boy. Talk to a cow man. Their write-off's about 100 bucks. They would say, oh, we can fix him, 75. Okay, do it. 102, kill him. That's it. It's just dollars and cents. So always present it to him and say, well, this is going to be pretty easy. It'll take three two-hour in-the-home visits. Each two-hour in-the-home visit, let's say you charge $200 for. Say so that's $600. Um, it's a lot of money, but it's going to take me six hours. Um, if you're on, write the check. Put your money where your mouth is. And that's a great way to get some compliance. If not, and you consider the dog dangerous, well, to me, level three and above, it's, it's, we've got to write a letter. You, it, 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 it is, by law, a reportable um, incident. And this actually is not in the dog training profession who should really know about this. All doctors know dog bites and gunshot wounds must be reported. All police know Gunshot wounds and dog bites must be reported, and traffic accidents. Dog trainers don't know it and don't do it. Uh, neither do veterinarians. Because, of course, you know, there you are. Say, well, let me squeeze his anal glands. Oh, shit! All uh, right, yeah, dog just bit me. Yeah, I was squeezing his anal glands, and we got a level three bite on my hand. I mean, you just wouldn't have any clients, <laughs> okay? Um, so you need to do something serious now. And, and I like the idea of a letter to them and a copy in your files, copy to the vet. And now we have a record that you warned them. This is a dangerous animal. The danger isn't that great. It's only a level three, but it will get worse without treatment. And I would even add in there is to the vet, um, the owner is not pursuing treatment with me. That's it. You've covered your butt. Uh, as well, anyone here ever been sued? As a dog trainer, I mean. We got um, sued once and then attempted twice. And they were all the same, the suits. The first one was someone got bitten by a dog. I don't even know this dog. It turns out he was a puppy in Sirius or oh, eight years previously. Uh, the person sued 50 animal-related people. Pet store owner, every groomer, every trainer, every veterinarian, all got sued. And what happened? My insurance settled. Then they wrote to me they'd cancelled my insurance. Second time it happened, um, I'd, I'd do a quick ring round and I find uh, Pat Cook, another trainer, English lady. She's been sued too. And I said, I'm going after them. I rang up my insurance company. I said, look, this is a fatuous lawsuit. You know, they're suing, we found out, a total of 40 people. And what they want is just eight grand from each, you know, settlement. I said, if you settle, I'm coming after you. Mm -hmm. This is what insurance is all about. Mm -hmm. You stop them, or else you'll find out, you know, what puppy training is all about. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. 
<laughs> and it was so lucky. I just got this guy. He was 72 years old, and he was retired, but he came back to do occasional cases. He says, I'm going after them. Mm -hmm. He calls back two hours later saying they've dropped the suit against you. I said, what about Pat? He says, Pat who? He says, hang on. He calls back, they've dropped the suit against Pat too. Like, boom, boom, boom. So cover your butt because you've acknowledged there's a biter. It's level three is puncturing skin. Next question. <clears throat> Have you noticed uh, any correlation between dogs with extreme social phobia with humans and an overcompensation with aggression with other dogs? I seem to see this often. What do you mean by overcompensation? In other words, much more dog-to-dog -dog aggression, but so severely antisocial with people that they're terrified to be social with people. So I've visited several people, and it seems to be there's an overcompensation with the dogs they live with or other dogs they visit with. Um, yeah, I, I haven't seen many cases like that, but I would certainly expect it, because we're talking about a dog now, which is so weird, so far out in left field. Whenever you get into this generalized fear thing, um, Ooh, you're starting to lose track of the thread of what is normal. And again, let's, let's talk about rescue and sanctuary because when we look at dogs, we all like dogs, we all fearful, feel for dogs, especially when they don't have homes. And what are the ones we really feel for? The fearful ones. And you're getting a dog that has generalized fear. I mean, to everything not just to people and other dogs now and the environment. And this is then adopted out. And what you're adopting out is a total lifelong project. OK? Um, and I think we need to think about this for, for a little. And, and also, the dog is in extreme stress. I mean, extreme and utter stress, so we should think about it. We're going to take a quick pause here. We have a visitor who's coming up to give me a prezi, I think. So, is it a friend of mine from England, Martin, Martin Dealey. You got a lot of presents? A lot of presents. Have you got an extra mic? I have an extra mic. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Just don't rip it out. Yeah. Thank you. Is that on? You hear me? Okay, can you hear me now? Okay. In fact, it's rather nice. Uh, Ian's the only person I think that's been known other than my wife as Mrs. Dealey. And getting to tell you that story, it's quite an interesting one. No, we will not be telling you Mrs. Dealey's story. No. <laughs> Thanks for giving me a few minutes of your time. I hope you don't mind me interrupting at all. Um, yes, I have got some prezies for Ian. You know, it was about, uh, last night we were in dinner, we'd had a few wines, we'd had a few beers, I think we were having a cigar, and uh, Ian said to me, our fate had uh, done different things to us. Fate was an important thing in life. About ten years ago, Ian and I uh, met, I think it was at a country fair in England, and because of that country fair, actually, uh, we did some television programs together, he was the star, and I was the kind of guy that knew what he was doing. And, <laughs> and we had a lot of fun together. And as I say, we've spent a lot of time together. And I suppose fate brought us together in that way. But since that time, Ian has influenced my life tremendously. I'm sure that when you all go away from this conference, um, he'll influence your lives as well, as he has done thousands and thousands of others. For those that don't know me, my name is Martin Dealey. I now live in Florida because of Ian. Uh, he lives in California, so I live in Florida. Um, um, and the reason basically is that I'm president of the International Association of Canine Professionals. We were set up five years ago with the aim of bringing together all the professionals within the dog industry. We felt that it was important that vets talk to trainers, trainers talk to groomers, groomers talk to kennel owners, kennel owners talk to breeders, and that we helped each other a lot. And we were set up to do education, networking, certification, and all kinds of things, and to try and help everyone create a profession. But we wouldn't have even thought about it if it hadn't been for a guy called Ian Dunbar. It's as simple as that. 
I say, fate brought us together. When, uh, when I met Ian, he said to me, I'm doing a conference in Florida, just down the road from here. Will you come and talk for me? So I thought, America, I haven't been there for about 30 years. Yes, I'd love to. Of course, yes, I'd always the answer. travel and hotel room. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. When we'd done the conference, he said to me, would you like to do a, a workshop tour? So I said, yes, I'd love to. On that workshop tour, which I now have done, uh, let's say, I met a, a, a lady who said to me, would I do a workshop for them? And that was nine years ago. And this year is my ninth workshop, in fact, in Florida with that lady. Uh, on the workshop tour, I met a lady who became my wife. Uh, and therefore, I moved over here. And I moved to Dallas and then to Florida. IACP was set up simply because of the kind of work that Ian was doing and the need to bring professionals together. And fate brought us together. There's no, nothing about fate after that. It's the influence of one man. And about three years ago, the association decided, you know, in all these industries and all the kinds of professions, we recognize people. People who have made an impact on the profession. And we've recognized people like Edie Munica, Winifred uh, Gibson Strickland, um, Frank Inn, the uh, Weatherwax Brothers, and we began to think about who influences these days. And you know, when we look at the professionals that's out there, and there's a lot of professionals out there now, people who are making a very good living, let's just say it that way, from doing what we all love, and that's helping people with dogs. There's a lot of them wouldn't be there except for one man, and that's Ian Dunbar. It's as simple as that. There's no other word for it. Um, when I first watched Ian talk, I thought to myself, gosh, it must be great to be the kind of guy who can motivate, the kind of guy who can sell ideas, get people involved, get a following. But he did more than that. What Ian did was to create a profession for trainers, something that had been a kind of an amateur thing, Something that people didn't really think about getting because, you know, you just went along to an obedience club maybe or you got somebody next door to help you. And what did they do? They used old-fashioned techniques. We were very, very slow in progressing. And he brought his charisma. He brought his motivation. He brought his knowledge. He brought himself and gave of himself, I think, and that's what the IACP think too, to the dog industry. Without Ian, we wouldn't be here. There's no other word for it. I know that when you go away from here, he will have influenced your lives. I know they influenced mine 10 years ago. I know he influenced a lot of our members, a lot of members of other associations as well over those years that he's been working. And I just hope that this is not his last one. He keeps telling me it is. I hope it isn't because we need people like Ian and the Hall of Fame with the IACP was developed three years ago to recognize these kind of people. And it's a great honor to me to recognize a friend and a man I respect tremendously for what he has done by just presenting him with an award as a new inductee for the Hall of Fame of the International Association of Crane Professionals. Thank you. Gorgeous. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. All right. That's super. And that's to put on his wall. And this, if he's brave enough, is to put on his head. <laughs> <laughs> With golf, we give them a green jacket. With IACP, cool. we give them a green hat. Uh, thank, thank you, you Martin. Thank you, buddy. Thank you very much for what you do. We can, um, don't, um, don't go too far. Um, we are, all the guys are meeting in the bar in about, um, oh, five minutes. That Ian's buying all the men here a drink. I'm having my bachelor night um, now. It'll be a bachelor afternoon. We will not talk about dogs, and we will chat about all sorts of things. Um, they, they were just too many kind words. That um, It's actually, you know, 
it is much easier being a motivator than a doer. I mean, you are the folks that do it and get it done. Um, I look on myself just as a cheerleader. Rah, rah, occasionally, get you going, but you're the folks who are out there, so keep on doing it. Tomorrow, we're actually going to talk about what are the things we can do to really make us professional in the afternoon, the whole promotional number. So I will see you tomorrow. All guys, I will see you now in the bar. Thank you.